Every day it's something new here at 24-7. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sergio Chavez. I'm one of the pastoral team here with uh, Pastor Mika. Um, and so thank you for being here for today. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little story of when I was, uh, when I was younger, uh, when I was a teenager or so. Um, I was the youngest of my family. So I have an older brother who's eight years older than I am and a sister. And being the youngest and uh, where, where we grew up, you know, we're poor immigrants, there's a lot of hand-me-downs that happened. So I got a lot of secondhand clothes from my brother. But one of those was actually a sweet pair of 501 jeans. Um, and I, th- I want to say it was probably the first name brand jeans that I ever had. Um, because we normally we got the Lee, the Kmart special Lees. Um, so somehow my, bro- you know, my brother was old and I was, he was working. So he bought this pair of 501 jeans. And he, he had used them, so he gave them to me. And so then I rocked them. Um, and these jeans were great. And, uh, but eventually, you know, I'm, I'm rough on my clothes. Like I'm rough on everything. Like things need to last if they're coming to me. And so I wore myself through them and they started getting holes in the jeans. And my mother, who's Latina, very proper. She's like, you can't be rolling deep with holes in jeans. No puedo estar así con los hoyos ahí. También es como un callejera. No, 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 no. Vámonos, quítelos, tíralos. For all of you who don't understand Spanish. <laughs> yeah. Yes, my mother said rolling deep. My mother said, you can't be walking around with holes in your jeans. You look like a street person. You look like a homeless person. You have to get rid of them, throw them away. And so somehow this came up in conversation at school with my, uh, my friend, Kelly, who was with me. And she was like, well, can I have your jeans then? And I'm like, sure, I guess. Why not? So I gave her my jeans. And so her being a girl, well, she just made the holes look better and look fashionable. And she rocked those jeans for a while. So this one pair of 501 jeans went through my brother for a while, went through me, and then went through my friend Kelly for who knows how long. It was a good pair of jeans that lasted the, all that span of time because that is what jeans were meant to be. They were meant to be sturdy and rugged and to be able to last quite some time. So for those of you who may not know, we're in the middle of a sermon series called uh, Style and Story where we're talking about um, the inspiring stories behind certain fashion items. And thank you to uh, Pastor Mika for last week where he talked about uh, Aloha shirts or Hawaiian shirts. Very intriguing. Thank you very much. Um, Today, I get to talk about blue jeans. Um, And one of the things that, in listening to the podcast that uh, interested me most about blue jeans was um, what they were originally made from. And that was denim. Uh, But pure denim, like denim from the old, old days. Um, It was about from the, the end of the 19th century, and pure denim was made from pure cotton, 100% cotton, which was rough, and it was rugged, um, and it could, uh, you know, stand the test of time, um, but it was really stiff. Um, There was no flex to it when they were brand new, Um, and as well, the color blue that we got in blue jeans came from uh, the indigo plant, a natural indigo dye, and that's where we got blue jeans from, and the indigo was made from this natural plant. It was kind of tough to make. It, It took a while. Um, But it became very popular at the end of the 19th century. And so blue jeans were first made um, by Levi Strauss, who he's the one who made it popular. And he really didn't patent, it wasn't the denim that attracted people, it was the rivets. He he patented the rivets on the jeans because that would, they wouldn't tear as much. They would hold them together more. So that was a big selling point that they had these rivets. And and the first jeans didn't have belt loops because they already wore suspenders. So they just had like these buttons so you could put your suspenders on them. Um, and then the indigo dye was just very attractive. Um, and it's interesting fact about the indigo dye is that uh, it, was, it was already here in America for a little bit, but it was, it was made really popular by basically a 16-year-old girl. Her name was Eliza Lucas, and her family was from Antigua. And her father sent her some indigo seeds from the Caribbean, from Antigua, and she decided to plant them in North Carolina, which they grew really well in North Carolina because it's hot and humid, very much like the Caribbean. So it became a cash crop. So indigo all of a sudden became really popular in America. And so this combination of, of pure cotton and indigo creating this one pair of iconic piece of fashion. The jeans were first very functional, meant for working and meant for, for you know, being tough and lasting, but eventually it caught on and became the popular fashion item that we know today. Most likely every single one of you either owns now or has owned a pair of blue jeans. And when I was going through this podcast, I couldn't help but think like how this relates to the Bible. And as I was listening, I love this idea of the purity and the rawness of blue jeans and the history of it that most people probably don't know. 
Um, but there is this, this purity of the original version of blue jeans. Um, and as I thought of that, I thought about the church. I thought about we as a community, we as a church, and church in general, we have an idea of what church is, but some of us might not understand where church came from. Biblically, where did it come from? So that's what I want to look at today. So in order to do that, where what church is, where it came from, we have to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. We have to go all the way back to uh, Genesis, actually, Genesis 17. So there was a time when God um, called out this cat named Abram, um, who later changes his name to Abraham. Maybe you guys know the name Abraham. Well, he tells, Abram's pretty old. Him and his wife are old. They have no children. And God calls him out and he says, look, you're going to have some kids. I'm going to bless you with kids. And from your kids, you're going to have a lot of descendants. He actually tells them, go outside at night. He says, try to count the stars. That's how many descendants you're going to have. He goes, and I'm going to make a covenant with you. And we read this in Genesis 17.7. Um, 7. It says, and I, God speaking, I will establish my covenant between me, God, and you, and your offspring. So all your children... And after you, throughout their generations, so the children of your children, so the chitlins of chitlins keep on going on, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offsprings and after you. So in the very beginning of the Bible, we hear how God makes his covenant with Abram and his descendants. This covenant that means that God has now chosen a people. They're come to known in the Bible as the chosen people of of God. And we hear them uh, 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 name, they, they have a, quite a few names in the Bible, like uh, Israelites, uh, Hebrews, Jews, and Samaritans. But the point is that they were the chosen people of God. They were the ones who were carrying the covenant um, that God made with Abram. And you see that the, he didn't, God didn't set up an uh, organization, He didn't set up a building, He set up a people, a covenant with a people to begin with. Now, that these Hebrews or these Jews now had this covenant with God, you would think everything would be pretty cool, like I'm chosen by God. Everything should run pretty smoothly. Well, it didn't always work out that way. It actually, they suffered quite a bit. They, they had quite a bit of struggles. We hear in the Bible, um, not far after this, they become slaves under Pharaoh for 400 years. They have to escape that. Um, they end up wandering in the desert for a while. Um, eventually, God says, hey, you know, I'm going to take you to a promised land. And, it, and when they finally get to this promised land, they, they build a, basically the capital city for themselves, Jerusalem. But that's always constantly under attack. Jerusalem currently is one of the oldest cities um, in the world, along with some other ones. But Jerusalem, in its long history, has been destroyed at least twice. Uh, it's been besieged over 20 times. It's been captured and recaptured over 40 times. And it's been attacked over 50 times. And yet, and, and through this history, even just being attacked, there's times where when it's destroyed, the Israelites get taken out of Jerusalem and they get put in exile in Babylon. And now they have to live under another, uh, under another rule in Babylon. So this persecution of God's people has happened for a long time, all the way up to current history. Um, in wars and all kinds of things. But God's chosen people, this small group of people, they are a resilient people. They are not destroyed. And you, we hear this phrase, even when they mess up with God, we hear in the Old Testament a lot of times where God says, well, in the Bible it says, and then God remembered his covenant with Abraham. So this covenant is Binding This covenant is what's keeping them going. And so throughout the whole Testament, we continually hear this. And then we get all the way to the New Testament where we hear about Jesus. Now, Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, through his death and resurrection, this covenant gets expanded. Now it's not just for the lineage from Abraham, but now it's for everyone. And we see this in the Bible uh, several times. It's explained in New Testament, but I like the way Paul explains it in Romans. So he's, he's writing to a group of people in Rome, and he puts it this way in Romans 9, 24, 26. It says, even us, so Jews, even us whom he has called, 
not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So Gentiles are people who are non-Jewish. It says, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. So now this covenant that was just with people back in the old days, now it's with everyone. And we hear this phrase, um, Pastor Mika many times when he prays, he's like, children of the living God. We hear them say, have you guys heard him say that in, in uh, service before? This is what he's talking about. He's not just, just um, using a nice name to make it sound like we're very religious. No, it's because the church, the people, we're part of this covenant. We're children of of the living God, for those who believe in Christ now can be part of the covenant. So hopefully I'm starting to paint a picture that it's not a building, it's not an institution um, that the church was found, the foundation of it, but it is this covenant between God and his people. So back, back to blue jeans. So as I was saying, the original blue jeans was what you see on the left-hand side here. This is an actual raw pair of denim. So it's 100% cotton. It's made by indigo dye, and it's super, super stiff. It's really stiff. Um, and it's like sandpaper almost. It's, it's really hard. To wear them is not very comfortable. It's uh, uh, in the podcast, a, a guy who owns a, a company that makes raw denim He's like, yeah, you know, you really have to be committed to want to wear raw denim because you're going to get chafed. <laughs> He's like, I've been chafed quite a bit. Um, but, you know, of us denim heads, you know, we want this, this, this experience, this raw experience. So, you know, we go through it. You have to wear raw denim for like six months before you ever wash it the first time. Um, so it's chafing you for who knows how long. And for what reasons, <laughs> yeah, in order to break them in. So just like, I just got a brand new pair of leather boots not too long ago. These things were so stiff. When I first was wearing them, I couldn't feel like I could bend my feet because I had to break them in. I had to wear them long enough where now they have some bend. Well, denim was very much, is very much like that. It's so stiff and it takes a while in order for you to break them in. But once you break them in, they begin to feel soft they begin to, you know, the color starts to wear away. As, as you see all the little white in our denim, um, that's, the, that's the wearing within your denim. And the thing about today is we don't really have raw denim jeans. Our jeans today are not pure cotton. And your jeans come soft. And that is because all of jeans pretty much for today are processed beforehand. So what they do is that they, they take your jeans, they make them, and then they stonewash them. They put them in a washer with a bunch of pumice stones, and that washes them and softens them up. So what used to be a person having to walk in them for six months is now done um, in a washing machine. And we don't even have pure indigo dye anymore. Now it's synthetic dyes because it, I, to make indigo dye it's really finicky you know it, you have to do it right and so it costs too much to make it so therefore we start making it um, with synthetics so now today jeans are not pure cotton they have spandex and lycra and all kinds of other stuff and polyester um, or as my friend Kelly who I was talking about would call it of many esters she was a word nerd so for those of you who don't know what that means poly means many esters so of many esters <laughs> If you have nerd friends, you can use that joke. If you have friends like mine, maybe just keep it to yourself. So, <laughs> so of many esters, so polyesters, which is essentially plastic. All these materials are plastic. Mine are Levi's 511 jeans, which have spandex, which is why I can do this <laughs> in them. <laughs> yeah, keep, maybe keep that one to yourself as well. But the thing about it is plastic breaks down very different than cotton. Um, we don't really know um, how, what's going to happen to them over the long period of time. We know they don't last as long um, because they have plastic in them. They're not 100% um, cotton. Um, so they're not quite as sturdy. So even though I had a good pair of 501 jeans, you know, they lasted between me and my, uh, my brother, myself and my friend 
original blue jeans can last through generations. They actually have a pair of some original jeans that are 136 years old in the history, uh, or the history museum of Levi Strauss. Um, so I don't think my 501 jeans are going to last 136 years. I'm pretty sure these aren't either. Um, they'll probably last maybe 10, I don't know, maybe 20 years, who knows. But we don't really know what's going to happen to them on the long run. But we do this for ease of use. We do this because it's easier to buy stuff that's already like broken down for us and cheaper and easier to make instead of having to go to raw jeans. So back to the Bible. So eventually, uh, in the Bible, mainly in the New Testament, it begins to refer to the sons and daughters of the children of the living God to ecclesia. And ecclesia um, in Greek um, is comprised of, of two, two different words. In, in Greek, the word is compound of two segments, ek, which is a preposition meaning out of, and the verb kelio, signifying to call. So together, they are to call out, the ecclesia. And then uh, further on in the Bible as well, um, they also use the word ecclesia for the assembly. Assembly. Now, there's a lot of things I don't like about English. English. But one of the things that I don't like about English is how we've turned the word church. So... So ecclesia, the Greek word for what the Bible uses as what we know as church, in Spanish, we actually use the word iglesia. Sound familiar? Iglesia, ecclesia. But in English, we ha it has gone through this long parts of, tra of uh, translation and it, and it has come down to the word as church. Now, there's nothing wrong with the word church. That's not the problem, is that in... I will, America is the only other culture that I've ever experienced. So I will say in American culture, I feel, and in talking with most people, we have turned the, the, we, the term church to mean a building or an organization. We even say we're going to church. Well, what does that mean? Ecclesia are the called out ones. Ecclesia are the assembly, meaning you are the church. So wherever one or two of you are gathered, you are assembled, you are the called out ones. So how can you go to church? What you're going to really, I think is a better phrase, is you're going to worship. You're going with others who are called out to worship and not to church. An interesting thing is that the word church is derived from the Scottish word kirk, um, or in German, kirch. I think it's, I don't know how you say the end of it. Um, what's that? Captain James Kirk, Captain James Siberius T. Kirk. So it's coming from the word Kirk. And Kirk in English is C-I-R-C-E, which is interesting. So it's convoluted, so it's also Kirk. But the problem with that is Kirk is the daughter of a sun god who was famous for taming her wild animals in her circus. Yeah, so that's where we get the word Kirk from. And I don't know why... It went from Kirk being K sounding C I R C E to circus being S I S R E C. Maybe Kirkus didn't sound right, so they went to circus instead. But that's what I'm going to say from now. We're going to the Kirkus. And if they get upset with me, I was like, you go talk to Oxford English Dictionary. They're the ones who messed it up. So there's this convoluted um, history with the word church. I live in Kirkland, Churchland, right? <laughs> Churchland, so there should be about a thousand churches in Kirkland, because um, that's what it's saying. But the, the problem with that is that we're so far removed from the word ecclesia that at times I've spoken with people, and they don't recognize that what the church means are the people. I've said it many times here before, the church is not a building, it is the It is the people. And because we're so far removed from its original um, meaning, it starts to fade a little bit of its, of its original intent and of how we interact with each other as well. I like this, um, this, uh, this quote from Robert Banks. It says, The Ecclesia is not merely a human association, a gathering of like-minded individuals or religious purpose, but it is a divinely created affair. That covenant made with Abraham is continued. 
So we're not just here to meet one another. We're not just here to hang out. We're here to worship. We're here because we're called out. We're here because there's something that we believe in, something that is called out from God to us. This is more than a place to listen and to sing. It is a place to interact. It all comes down to a relationship. That is what the covenant was. So what makes the ecclesia? Well, to continue covenant with God, a relationship with God, the teaching and caring of its people, discipling one another, and showing God's love to all they encounter. I don't get discouraged about a lot of things. I tend to be a fairly positive person. I have my moments. And my, you can talk to my wife and she can tell you all of them because she knows every single one of them. <laughs> but there's not a lot of things I get discouraged about church. If the chairs aren't set up right, not a big deal. If we mess up at music like I did today with one string that was out of tune, not that big a deal. Even if the sermon isn't that good, not that big a deal. I'll tell you, <laughs> I don't know about that. I'll tell you what discourages me most about the church. What I get discouraged the most, and it just, just happened recently to today, is that I talked to somebody within our group, and I said, hey, how's it going? And they were having a tough time. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And, and they said, well, thank you for reaching out to me, because most people don't. That's what discourages me. Because we think of church as the time that we come here together as a time we assemble, but that is not the church. The church is the relationship we have with God and the relationship we have with others. I don't even care if we don't have music. I don't care if we don't have chairs. I don't care if we don't have a microphone. What I care about, because what God cares about, is the relationship we have with each other. So how does that change our view of church? We're not going to church. We're coming to worship together. I think everything kind of sums up here a little bit about the importance of the church as we hear it. In Matthew 16, 13, 17, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's asking them, who, who do people say who I am? And they say, well, they, some say you're John the Baptist or some say you're, you're Elijah. Of these, maybe some say you're an old prophet. And finally Jesus says, okay, I, who do you say that I am? So he's talking to his disciples who walked with him for three years. They said, well, you're the, you're the son of God. And so Peter replies, and so Christ says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Meaning there was some divine intervention here. But my Father who is in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is one of the few times in the New Testament that they actually use the word church. Every other time, aside from there's one other time, it's assembly, it's congregation. But this is the one time that they use church. And look what Jesus says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's many things that the church, the people, those who are in the covenant have faced and will continue to face. But because it's a covenant with God, it will be everlasting. So, 24-7, this church, we've been through a lot. We're 13 years old, technically. 2006 is when we opened our doors. We opened them at Bellevue uh, College. Yeah, you were five years old. I was 25, 24. We had no kids yet. Um, Lauren and I weren't even married yet. We were, yeah, we were the young adults. And we were just, now we're just old, old and crusty. <laughs> yeah, like jeans. That's right. And through this, through our church, families have moved. Pastors have moved on. But we're not gathered around a person. We're gathered around each other. See, 24-7, when we, when we were in the original meetings, which I was a part of in 2003 with Matthew Gamble, we planned this to be on the original meaning of church, and that is the covenant of God and of people. That's why it didn't matter that we were Bellevue 
community college, or it mattered that we went at the other building, or it mattered that we're here at this building. Because our covenant is with God. The head of the church is not a person. It's Jesus. I'm sorry to say that. One day I will die. One day Pastor Mika will die. I know. I'm just including you in my emotions. We've lost members before. But this church wasn't built on my blood or Pastor Mika's blood or Pastor Gamble's or Pastor Letty's or Pastor Gary's. It was only built on the original blood. And that is of Jesus. That original indigo dye. See, there's a reason why I've said pastor dependency is not good for a church. Because when a pastor fails, the church fails. It means that that church was not worshiping God. It was worshiping a person. Let us enjoy this everlasting covenant that God has made with all of us. Because the job we have is to lift one another up, to be loved by, from that covenant, and to share it with everyone that we come across. That's what it means to be church. It's not these chairs. It's not the equipment. It's not the building. It is the people. Please stand with me. If you haven't found a church, an ecclesia, a people, we welcome you here. Talk to somebody. Talk to me. Talk to Pastor Mika. And the responsibility to all of us here is to talk to one another. Check in on one another. From Saturday to Saturday, you got six days to check in on one another. Text, call, Facebook, do whatever you guys have to do. But let us continually build on that covenant that God made so many years ago. Bow your heads with me. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for dying on a cross for us. Thank you so much for sticking with your people, Lord. Even when we've messed up, even when we have sinned or whatever the things we have done wrong, we can run back to you and forgiveness, grace, and mercy is available to us, Lord. Thank you for remembering your covenant with us, Lord. We are here to worship you. We are here to be blessed by you in order to bless others, Lord. We're here to be your humble servants. Thank you for loving us in your beautiful in your glorious name. And together we all said, Amen. Amen.